Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or on my website at www.josiesartschool.com. I'd like to start with some words from Henry Nouwen in his book, Spiritual Direction. For many years, I have read, reflected on, and taught the gospel words in Luke 3 in the story of Jesus' baptism. But only in my later years have they taken on a meaning far beyond the boundaries of my own religious tradition. God's words, you are my beloved, reveal the most intimate truth about all human beings, whether they belong to any particular tradition or not. The ultimate spiritual temptation is to doubt this fundamental truth about ourselves and trust in alternative identities. Sometimes we answer the question, who am I, with the response, I am what I do. When I do good things and have a little success in life, I feel good about myself. But when I fail, I start getting depressed. And as I get older and can't do much, all I can say is, look what I did in my life. Look, 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 I did something good. Or we might say, I am what other people say about me. What people say about you has great power. When people speak well of you, you can walk around quite freely. But when somebody starts saying negative things about you, you might start feeling sad. When someone talks against you, it can cut deep into your heart. Why let what others say about you, good or ill, determine who you are? You might also say, I am what I have. For example, I am a Dutch person with kind parents, a fine education, and good health. But as soon as I lose any of it, if a family member dies, if my health goes, or if I lose my property, then I can slip into inner darkness. How much of our energy goes into defining ourselves by deciding, I am what I do. I am what others say about me. I am what I have. When that's the case, life often follows a repetitive up and down motion. When people speak well about me, and when I do good things, and when I have a lot, I am quite up and excited. But when I start losing, when I suddenly find out that I can't do some task anymore, when I learn that people talk against me, when I lose my friends, then I slip into the pit. What I want to say to you is that this whole zigzag approach is wrong. I am not what I do, and you are not what you do, or what others say about you or what you possess. You are God's beloved. I hope you can hear these words as spoken to you with all the tenderness and force that love can hold. My only desire is to make those words reverberate in every corner of your being. You are the beloved. The voice that speaks from above and from within whispers softly or declares loudly, you are my beloved son or daughter, on you my favorite rests. It certainly is not easy to hear that voice in a world filled with voices that shout, you are no good, you are ugly, you are worthless, you are despicable, you are nobody unless you can demonstrate the opposite. These negative voices are so loud and so persistent that it is easy to believe them. That's the trap of self-rejection. It is the trap of being a fugitive, hiding from your truest identity. From L. Luna's book, The Crossroads of Should and Must. Vincent van Gogh chose must when he continued to paint canvas after canvas, even after the world rejected his art. 
His work went largely unrecognized while he was alive. It can be challenging to understand in our hyper-connected world of likes and comments and follows what being truly, utterly unseen might have felt like. In a letter to his brother Theo in 1882, he describes such a feeling. What am I in the eyes of most people? A non-entity, an eccentric, an eccentric, or an unpleasant person? Somebody who has no position in society and will never have, in short, the lowest of the low. All right, then, even if that were absolutely true, then I should like to show by my work what such an eccentric, such a nobody, has in his heart. A lawyer in his 30s chose must every day for years as he woke awoke at 5 a.m. to write stories about harrowing crimes and evil doings, all before going to his job at the courthouse. Eventually, after three years of juggling writing and criminal defense, he shaped his stories into a novel which he sent to publishers. Must is why, even as editors rejected his book again and again, the lawyer-slash-author kept going and eventually received a yes. And it's why John Grisham is a household name today. A small group of entrepreneurs in San Francisco chose must when their new business idea, an unheard of space rental service named airbedandbreakfast.com, was running out of money and the idea was not gaining traction. But because they believed it would succeed, the team hatched a wild idea to create Airbnb-branded boxes of cereal and sell them at the 2008 Democratic National Convention. The team designed a cartoon illustration of Obama, found a cereal manufacturer in California, hot-glued the tops and numbered each one through 500, and sold them online for $40 each as art. These collectible boxes ended up on CNN, Good Morning America, and across the press. With hope in every bowl, the small, fledgling Airbnb team found a creative way of making money fast when every conceivable metric said they should quit. But if must is so great, why don't we choose it every day? The Origin of Should Shoulds are put on you from the moment you are born. You have to grow up under someone else's wing. It's a normal, healthy process for parents to give shoulds and for children to receive them. Because you, the child, must learn how to navigate the world. In addition to what you receive from your parents, you inherit a worldview from the community, culture, and specific time in which you were born. As you grow up, you decide you get to decide how you feel about that worldview. It is a natural process to become your own person, to find your voice, convictions, and opinions, and to challenge and shed the shoulds that no longer serve your evolving beliefs. But sometimes we linger in should a little longer than expected. Blue Iris by Mary Oliver Now that I am free to be myself, who am I? Can't fly, can't run, and see how slowly I walk? Well, I think, I can read books. What's that you're doing? The green-headed fly shouts as it buzzes past. I close the book. Well, I can write down words like these softly. What's that you're doing? Whispers the wind, 
pausing in a heap just outside the window. Give me a little time, I say back to its staring silver face. It doesn't happen all of a sudden, you know. Doesn't it? says the wind, and breaks open, releasing the distillation of blue iris. And my heart panics, not to be as I long to be, the empty, waiting, pure, speechless receptacle.